Linux Luddites, episode 93, for the 12th of December, 2016. And welcome to Linux Luddites, the show where we try all the latest free and open source software and then decide that we like the old stuff better. I'm Joe. I'm Jesse. And I'm Paddy. And we've got a bit of an Ubuntu fest today. Um, what with us looking at running Bash on Windows after the news. And 10 months on since we last span it up, revisiting Ubuntu Touch. To see if the promise of convergence is any nearer to being a practical reality. But with all that Ubuntu ness to come, should we kick off the news by talking about Fedora? Yeah, let's crack on with the news. So last time we talked about how Richard Brown of OpenSUSE talked about various numbers of users and saying that SUSE was more popular than Fedora. And we noted that there weren't any proper stats for Fedora users. And as if by magic, here we are a couple of weeks later, and we have some pretty decent numbers, don't we, for the, the actual numbers of users, or at least the number of distinct IP addresses per day hitting the Fedora mirror network. And it seems that it's been growing, although the numbers are pretty small from about 80,000 at its peak for Fedora 20 up to about 100,000-ish for Fedora 23. And Fedora 24 is on course to do a little bit better than that. But that's still... It, it doesn't seem as popular as I thought it would be. I guess I'm struggling to really put a number on what I thought a popular distro would have. I mean, obviously you can see clicks on distro watch, and, and that's always uh, touted as the way not to decide on whether a distro is well installed or has a large install base, but just on sort of popularity of that month. So I think, I don't know, I think 100,000 seems like quite a lot of installs for what is not the most popular you know, Linux desktop but one of the most popular. Yeah, I guess the numbers just sort of bring home that if we're talking about 2% Linux usage on the desktop, it really is very small. I mean, the point of this post wasn't so much to share the stats, although they were there to give an indication of how adoption changes when new versions come out into beta. Um, it was also to talk about how they do their scheduling. And I guess the fact that Fedora get quite a lot of press and we assume they have more users than they probably do in reality is down to publicity, and that's something they touched on as well, isn't it? Yeah, there's discussion there about whether or not having two release cycles a year sort of uh, overloads the press cycle, and therefore it just it sort of gets pushed down the list of interesting topics. You know, if you if something comes out every single month, you're hardly going to talk about it every month unless there's something really important. So the discussion here is whether or not they should move to an annual big release, and then I believe a sort of six monthly sort of tweak but without really pushing for the press. So you get a, a once a year big hit. Uh, so slightly different or sort of moving away from the Ubuntu way of doing things. I can't help but think that that's quite a good idea, really, to move to annual rather than six monthly. Because if you look at Ubuntu, particularly with the non-LTS releases, it's just not a big story anymore, is it? It's six months on since we last had one, and it's got a new kernel and newer versions of applications, but generally speaking, nothing's changed. And I know that we lost interest a long time ago in those. Whereas if it was annual, it makes it a little bit more special, a little bit more newsworthy. Yeah, I guess the question there is how you go on dealing with the fact that you're after up-to-date software, which is half of their pitch. And Jesse's already alluded to the fact they're talking about having a, a six-monthly bump as well. But you've got to wonder if they do go down this route, then... A, how are they going to deal with long-term support? Because the length of support for Fedora has always been something that's put me off them immensely. And secondly, how would they compete against things like Arch, which are up-to-date all the time? Well, if you're running Fedora, you wouldn't be really wanting a, a long-term support as much, I would say. I think you know part of the USP of Fedora is that it has the newest things and, and it's moving over to, to Wayland and it has new updates of software and things like this. So 
the fact that it has a short um, sort of support cycle, I would say is probably at one with the idea of why people install it, because they want to have the newest and keep on upgrading and, and keep it absolutely up to date. And, you know, I think the other reason you're not so fond of it is it sometimes bursts into flames. That's true enough. Um, I don't know. I think they're in a very uncomfortable position. They're sort of halfway between a rolling distro and a properly supported long-term support type distro. Um, and they're struggling for identity still. I know that a lot of work's been done on how they see themselves and where they can pitch themselves in the market. And that's changed quite a lot over the last few years. But they still seem to be straddling. And I still can't think what the uh, correct uh, metaphor is. Jesse, you're good at these broken <laughs> metaphors. Two horses, let's say. <laughs> two horses, yeah. They're still straddling two horses or two stools or whatever the phrase is. And they're neither fish nor fowl. And until they get that organized, I, I can't see a great uptick in the numbers that we're talking about, Joe. Well, that's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is it's very much like Hannah Montana and Miley Cyrus. It's the best of both worlds because you've got kind of up-to-date software that is more up-to-date than, say, an LTS distro like Ubuntu, but then it's not quite so bleeding edge as Arch where things can break potentially all the time. So you kind of, if you stay up-to-date every six months, then you've got reasonably up-to-date software but it's not on the bleeding edge if you know what i mean so i i think that's why a lot of people use it or maybe they're sort of getting used to fedora because they're the kind of people who use rel uh, and obviously rel's quite big on the server side and ubuntu is the number one on the server side this next article is to do with official ubuntu images now obviously ubuntu um does deals with some of the cloud providers and and was it infrastructure as a service and PAS and all these other ones that WAS, uh, big names like AWS, Azure, Google, things like this. And Mark has touted some of the benefits of this, the fact they can optimize for performance on that cloud. They can make sure that the images they provide are stable and secure. Um, and he sort of points out there's been a dispute with one of the cloud providers from Europe who doesn't name, uh, and they've been providing their own tweaked version of the Ubuntu images. So the problem with this is that it's insecure and it's broken and there's some there's going to be problems in the way that you update and it leaves some sort of holes in it and they've seen this previously apparently with other providers and they've had to sort of go and say look you've got this particular thing you've done wrong which is insecure you've done that thing there's sort of examples that he's written about but this one cloud provider is not listening to ubuntu and uh, apparently they're going to take some legal steps to uh, actually force them to either use the correct image or not provide ubuntu at all so when Paddy linked to this and I started reading it, Ubuntu is amazing on the cloud because we work with cloud providers to ensure crisp, consistent, and secure images. I was like, Shuttleworth's written this, hasn't he? Scroll down. Yep. Yeah, sure there's, a, there's this smiling smug face. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, wouldn't you be smug if you had that much dough? Yeah, true. If I'd been into space, I'd be pretty smug. <laughs> but it's kind of fair enough, isn't it, that if you're going to call something Ubuntu, then it's got to be Ubuntu. If you're going to take Ubuntu and modify it and, and make it less secure, then call it Mint. Oh. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, If it's not Ubuntu, don't call it Ubuntu and don't sell it as that. Yeah, it's absolutely fair enough. And if you're talking about products in the real world, the certainly laws in this country are on passing off. So if you go and order a Coke and they give you a Pepsi without informing you that's what you're getting, then they can actually be done in court for that. And I don't see why this situation is any different, to be honest. Yeah, from the way he's put it, it you know, they're, he's touting this as a last resort of the legal steps. They've tried to encourage them to do the right thing. And, you know, they've clearly had success previously where certain companies have released their own tweaked version of the Ubuntu image and they've maybe sort of hard-baked SSH keys in and things like this that can then be, uh, you know, corrupted and you get all sorts of problems down the line. So I get the impression he's he's maybe got to his wits end and decided to write this blog post to just sort of sort of point out there they've tried and this is then I say the last resort but as you point out Paddy a pretty fair thing to do because you can't have Pepsi when it's Coke. Well let's leave Mark shaking his fist at those pesky Europeans as many of us are doing um, but stay with Canonical for a minute and they've made some changes to snaps and introduced something called platform snaps. Now we're going to link to a couple of articles in the show notes. Uh, one's a Google Plus post and one's uh, an article by Harold Sitter, which is talking about how he 
use this to roll out some KDE applications. But the basic premise is well, Snaps used to contain all the dependencies you needed for your application. And the change means that you now can have a separate Snap that gets rolled into your Snap and used when it needs access to those dependencies across multiple Snaps. And I'm explaining this incredibly badly. But really what it means is dependencies are appearing for Snaps. They aren't going to be totally self-contained. And we're kind of back in the world where we started from, I think. Yeah, I was going to say, well, hang on. Isn't the point of Snaps that you don't have dependencies? I can see that there are advantages to be gained from having dependencies, and you don't have these huge Snaps anymore. But isn't that what Debs were doing in the first place? <laughs> I don't get it. Like it, This surely proves that Snaps are not the best idea in the world because there is a better way of doing things, and that was the old way. But there's nothing to stop you from bundling all your dependencies in a Snap anyway. So rather than having to have the sort of QT Snap to get all of the particular QT goodness that you might want, the libraries and what have you, and then install things that pull dependencies. You could just have your snap that requires Qt libraries and what have you all in one place, and that doesn't require it. I think it gets confusing when, if there's a snap that does require a pre-existing snap, maybe it's Qt, maybe it's GTK, whatever, you know, some sort of uh, KDE type big all-encompassing snap that's already installed that has all these dependencies if there's only the option of having that one snap that you want to install and it does require these other sort of bigger ones to be already there that's going to get confusing because it's going to have to then pull down that almighty second snap and the whole point of this is to make them a lot smaller so if as long as you can still make a snap and have it entirely you know uh, entirely enclosed in itself have all the dependencies in one thing that's fine I think this does go to, to muddying the water as to quite what the reason for Snaps is. I mean, maybe there's some benefit with the sandboxing or what have you, which carries on through. But, but I have to say, it does seem like a confusing step backwards. Yeah, I'm sure they'd point to the sandboxing aspect of it. To be frank, I just don't understand why they didn't do statically compiled binaries in the first place, which is what all sensible humans should be doing anyway, rather than all this library malarkey and actually introduce some proper sandboxing, and that would have solved the issue. I mean, disk space isn't an issue. We've talked about bandwidth being an issue for downloading things previously. Um, but that's largely a function of the fact that the toolkits and things that are used to build these applications are so bloated and junky themselves in the first place. And I hate to go back to beating the same old horse again, but all these things are related. And if people actually architected things properly in the first place and developers just didn't go off and generate fancy new frameworks that take 500 meg uh, to actually display a window on the screen, then we'd be in a far better place. But hey. Is that is that one of the horses you were straddling earlier? <laughs> it could be, <laughs> yes. The ones I was beating with stools as well. <laughs> All right, well, let's move on then and talk about OSS Fuzz, which is something that has been announced by Google. And this is something they've been developing with the core infrastructure initiative community. And I'm afraid I had to learn what fuzzing meant. And I think I understand it. Paddy, you can correct me if I'm wrong here. But it's basically you take a bit of software and then you blast it with random input and, and just try and break it and try and find the bugs in it. Is that a, a fair? Yeah, that's good. Enough. Okay, yep. that's, that's good. And so now you can have your software fuzzed by this on the understanding that they'll disclose any bugs they find to you, but if you don't deal with it in 90 days, then they'll just make them public, so you'd better get on with it. Yeah, it seems overall a very useful service that um, the Core Infrastructure Initiative uh, has sort of been involved with. Um, and we move on you know, with Mozilla, and they've released their 2015 uh, State of the Nation, if you will. And I sort of went through this, and they sort of explain what it is that they've been doing with products, what sort of web technologies they've been helping with, you know, what their mission is and all these sorts of things. And the list is long. Uh, so it's just covering 2015 with a little dabble into 2016 and, and looking at the financials as well. And it's things like Firefox for iOS, the private browsing with tracking protection, uh, Mozilla Web VR, WebGL, and, and now Web. GL2 coming out, Rust and Servo and Quantum, and a whole list of things they've done with sort of advocacy and education, uh, petitioning governments to try and reduce their 
uh, they're snooping. Uh, however, that hasn't worked quite so well in the UK. And and it does feel a bit like they've got a lot of fingers and a lot of pies, or they've thrown an awful lot of uh, at a wall and are trying to work out where it is that they can really sort of sort of push. So it, it it's just going to sort of prove to me that we, you know, when we discuss Mozilla and how many things they seem to be doing and how many things start and die, this is basically one huge list of all of those things that are starting and dying. And you mentioned the financials. There are a lot of big numbers in there, aren't there? A lot of zeros. Yeah, I thought they were, you know, reasonable. And then I realized that it was all in thousands. And so you put three more zeros in there and you think, oh, okay, that is some serious cash they've got. Yeah, there was a 28% increase in revenue uh, for 2015, up to $421 million. And they ended the year with well over $300 million in assets. Well, so they clearly have the cash to try all these things. And, you know, I mean, I say try these things. Some of what they're doing is very much part of their mission to get open source into people's hands and try and uh, lock down on privacy and things like this. A little bit questionable when they allow DRM into the, to the web browser, but, you know, they are pushing forward towards their mission. It just feels like it's quite a broad sort of range they've gone for. I know this isn't in the notes, chaps, but you can't have not noticed Wikipedia begging for money again recently. Every time you go there, huge adverts. And it just seems to remind me of Mozilla somehow with this huge pot of money, and yet they're still very keen for donations. Yeah, it's funny you mention that because normally it comes up with a big banner at the top and you just have to scroll down to ignore it. But there was like a pop-up on Wikipedia that said, you know, you as a member of the UK should be doing this, da, da, da. And I thought, oh, it's a bit sort of invasive. It was more, even more in your face than the big banner from uh, What's-His-Face Wales. And the Mozilla one, so obviously looking at this news story, sort of a bit of research around it, went to their main website. And again, there was a enter your information here and press one of these donate buttons to donate. I sort of tried to scroll around and get away from it. And it was, you know, a big, almost full page pop up that you had to say, no, carry on to Mozilla.org. Thank you very much. So there is an incredible similarity between the two that you've just pointed out, which, yeah, I was was surprised when, uh, when Mozilla was that in your face about it. Yeah, and the other similarity, of course, is they keep bringing in more than they spend. So they're actually increasing their pot. I mean, I went back and had a look at the Wikimedia Foundation numbers because um, somebody at home mentioned to me that they'd seen this banner and thought, oh, we're going to donate some money because they gain value from Wikipedia. And I had to explain to them very kindly that you're throwing it away, basically, because they don't need the money. So last year, they raked in just over $75 million, uh, but only spent a little bit over $50 million. And they're currently sat on well over 75 million in the bank. But I'm thinking about The Guardian here. So the funding for The Guardian newspaper is based on a huge pot of money, which allows them to not have to sort of be part of a massive newspaper conglomerate and they can allow people to look at their website for free without having a paywall and things like this because they have this sort of unique funding model, quote the BBC. Is that maybe, you know, part of the drive for the Wikimedia and Firefox? You know, if they had a billion pounds in the bank, they wouldn't have to do, you know, wouldn't have to be, uh, have sponsors and, and, you know, have tie-ins on their browser and things. They just do what they liked, creaming off the interest or, you know, investing it and and getting money that way, like a long-term plan. That's obviously the upside of that kind of business model. I mean, you mentioned the guards in there. You, you will notice they're constantly begging for cash every time I go, which is several times a, go, a day to read stories there. There's always big things begging for cash. And they're burning through stuff um, far faster than they're replenishing it. So they are actually going to run out of money in a few years' time. But the downside, of course, of that model is that it allows people to do things that wouldn't stand up in the market. I mean, that is the upside as well. You aren't beholden to anybody. But it means, for example, the Guardian can be totally out of whack with what the readership wants. And if you actually read the comments below the line over the last few months, you'll see people getting far more vociferous about pointing out the fact that the Guardian has totally gone off on one and has lost all credibility, really. I'm just still reeling from the fact that you, you read the Guardian. <laughs> <laughs> Why wouldn't I? I'm a left-wing guy. Come on. Uh, we talked about this before we started recording. Let's not go there again. Okay, let's move it on then. Um, Staying with politics, kind of, though, and given the belligerent tone and somewhat dubious activities of the US government, 
both China and Russia seem very keen to become less dependent on US tech companies. And the Russian government's chosen Sailfish to use the basis for its own mobile uh, operating system. And that's apparently going to be developed alongside a new organization called the Open Mobile Platform, which will then be adopted for use by government agencies and also state-owned corporations. Now, we've looked at Selfish OS, we've looked at Ubuntu, we've looked at Tizen, we've looked at the alternatives to iOS and Android. And for my money, Selfish came out on top, didn't it? So it's not a huge surprise that they've chosen this one, especially as it's Finnish, you know, Northern European, vaguely neutral. So it, it just makes absolute sense to me. Yeah, you missed out Firefox OS in the list, but that's obviously not an option anymore. And I absolutely agree with you. Of all the ones that we've looked at over the years, Sailfish OS does sit out as, you know, not just at the top, but by by a fair margin was the one that I would most likely pick up and use. Whether that is solely because it had fairly good uh, app integration from Android apps, but it also it was just a sort of a quite a nice interface, quite modern you know, worked well. And I have read various stories about Sailfish recently having some problems because of, you know, funding and, and getting phones to market, what have you. They've been quite quiet following the whole debacle about that tablet they did or didn't release. So I think this, you know, real push of funding, the fact that I know that Russia and Finland don't get on particularly well, but it, you know, at least they've sort of buried that hatchet because there's maybe a bigger enemy in Russia really wanting to to push away from from America, as you point out, Paddy. Yeah, what I found interesting, although I didn't see much reporting of it in the Western press, but I, I read a few translated stories in the Russian press about this, um, is they appear to be wanting to do more than use this for government agencies and state-owned corporations, which is what I mentioned earlier. I mean, Grigory uh, Berezkin, who's OMP's president, said in an interview with the main Moscow business newspaper that they are hoping that this will be targeted towards a mass audience and that smartphones based on the system will become inexpensive enough to replace Android. Well, that would be good, wouldn't it, to have a serious competitor to Android? I agree with the idea of having a serious competitor to Android. And if you've got, you know, the backing of the Russian government, that's a lot of pounds. Wait, what do the Russians use? Rubles. Oh, yeah, rubles. So there's a lot of those. However, would you be comfortable using an operating system, you know, let's say made by the Russian government? Yeah, we've had this conversation before, and I mean, whilst you might not want your data going back to the Russian government, the Russian government is in an awfully weak position to do anything with that data compared with, say, your data going back to the British or American governments if you happen to live in those two countries. I mean, I, I fear the Russian government a lot less than I fear my own government, put it that way. Because you're financially here and you've got a house here and all those sorts of things, because you're they can use it because they're you're within their grasp. Absolutely, yeah. I suppose it's like you, you hear these backdoors to China and stuff and you think, well, what are the Chinese going to do with my data? Not a lot, really. Although it still would be nice to use something that was totally free and open source and you knew wasn't giving anyone your data. And I suppose that is a point worth considering. Is Selfish going to become any more open as a result of this? I shouldn't have thought so. Yeah, maybe there'll be a sort of government-backed one all in Russian or what have you, and Selfish will have enough money to then make uh, a, a community version or you know a, a stripped out version with just the the core operating system. That'd be setting a dangerous precedent, wouldn't it, for the marketplace? Well, you've got AOSP, haven't you? It's that kind of model. Although I suppose that is going away slowly but surely. Yeah, absolutely, it's going away, and it's not functional. Or it won't be functional on its own. I mean, sorry, I was just being sarcastic. It would be delightful to see someone do that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, speaking of open source versions of Android, CyanogenMod is not looking too good, is it really? Given that they've kicked out Steve Kondik, aka Cyanogen, from Cyanogen Inc., that is the company that they set up, because he seems to have fallen out with Kirk McMaster, with whom he formed the company in the first place. And and we've reported before, haven't we, that Cyanogen Inc. has been in trouble. They tried to be an OS company. That didn't really work out, especially when they fell out with OnePlus. And they're trying to pivot to apps. And it's just, there's been trouble brewing. They laid off a lot of their staff. And, and now it looks like 
I don't know, very bad times for Cyanogen Inc. And it looks like that Cyanogen himself might have to fork it if he wants to carry on because of all the trademark stuff. And so it might well be that Cyanogen Mod will sort of, it might, might become the sort of open office to some new LibreOffice style version of Cyanogen Mod. And uh, I'll be keen to try it when that happens. Yeah, he's sort of asking a lot of questions. It's partly a blog post about where he is and why things have happened. But now that he's in that position, as you say, they've uh, parted ways, he's now sort of asking, well, should we have a rebrand? Is there things we should be doing differently from the way that we did with Cyanogen Mod? Are there things that worked, things that didn't work? So he's able to at least sort of reorganise and take a step back, get a holistic view and think, right, where do we want to actually go? Is AOSP, I guess it must be based on AOSP, given his you know knowledge and, and that's his sort of foundation. But I don't know if this is fundamental. Is, is Google and Android the way to base it on what have you? So yeah, it's sort of a an open discussion with the community as to how Cyanogen Mod 2, whatever it is it gets called, uh, how that looks. I do worry, though, that he might not be able to get it together uh, because there might be too many protracted legal battles with Cyanogen Inc. And, and that might slow it down. And meanwhile, that will slow down Cyanogen Mod. And we might get the situation where the only ROMs available are really old and outdated and, and potentially got security problems in them. And so, yeah, there are other ROMs available. There are a lot of other ROMs available that are based on AOSP and, and have various features in them. But I really, really like Cyanogen Mod. I've tried a few different ROMs and I think that the reason that Cyanogen Mod has become the most popular is because it is the best. And it's certainly what I have been using for a long time now. So here's hoping that they can either sort this out or we'll get a fork relatively quickly and that my devices will be supported. Well, we'll put phones uh, on the back burner for a moment and move on to IoT devices. And the sort of golden child of the open source IoT device at the moment is Mycroft. However, they've been a little bit quiet recently without many updates and without any real move towards releasing the devices that were paid for by Kickstarter. Was it Kickstarter? It was both, wasn't it? They had a go on Indiegogo and Kickstarter, which should have been a red flag to everyone. Well, they've they've given an update now and basically they've been explaining that the the sort of test runs that they were doing had some problems. So the the company making the test devices said it'd be three weeks, but it turned out to be four. Uh, they had unfortunately used a, an old design. So when Microsoft eventually received them, they realized they weren't the most up-to-date design. When they went back to make the new design, they had some unavailable components, and then there were some errors in the way in which they'd put the components together. So they've sort of been, you know, I think get the impression battling with their production, uh, you know, to iron out all the bugs or what have you. But they are expecting, or sort of a short time ago, expecting to have got 10 production units to test it and put it through its paces and make sure that it's ready for consumers. I think they're keen not to release something early, which doesn't function as well as they envision uh, so that everyone gets a good, you know, a good sort of device and, and it works well. But they also realize that not releasing devices and not giving anyone updates as to why gets quite bad, uh, you know, bad sort of feelings from the community when they've put their money where their heart is, really. So this is a short update from Mycroft, and hopefully those devices they've got work as planned, and Mycroft is released in the in the near future to those that backed it. But hang on, how hard can it be to put a Raspberry Pi in a box with a speaker and a microphone? You know, it just seems to me to be excuses. And they say that they'll soon be releasing a pre-built Raspberry Pi 3 image. Well, if they were in any sort of shape to release the hardware, then surely the software would be ready and they could do that already. They could give us an image and we could hook up our own speaker and microphone to it. Because that's all we're talking about. When, you, when it really boils down to it, we're talking about a nice looking box with a speaker and microphone and a Raspberry Pi in it running the Microsoft software. And it, could it be that this catalog of excuses about the hardware are just to try and buy time while they sort out their software? Is it really just a Raspberry Pi in a box? Does, does the one you buy not have actual Microsoft hardware 
and then you can have a Raspberry Pi if you want. No, it's based on the Raspberry Pi. That's the whole point of that's why we're talking about it. Well then, yeah. Put a mic <laughs> put, you know, all you need is a microphone and speaker. I think I was gonna explain exactly what you just said. I, I have the of the impression that yes, you could put it on a Raspberry Pi, and that was what, you know, people were excited to do to be able to have it themselves. And there's already some examples of of getting Mycroft onto the Raspberry Pi. There's uh, a GitHub page that you can get it off. But I thought the actual device that you got that you paid for, you were paying for hardware in a nice box but the hardware was bespoke as well no if you look at the kickstarter and it said pledge 99 dollars or more early adopter mycroft basic uh includes mycroft unit uh which is an enclosure with custom led display raspberry pi 2 and wi-fi um so yeah it, it it's just a raspberry pi in a box guys it can't be that hard I don't know. It's very difficult, isn't it, not to be cynical because uh, we've seen so many and reported on so many instances of sort of crowdfunded efforts um, going horribly wrong over the years. Yeah, which leads us on to Pebble. Pebble, who were, as far as I understand it, the first manufacturer of any sort of smartwatch. They they beat everyone else to market. There was talk of the iWatch, as it was then called, which turned out to be called Apple Watch, and then Android Wear. But Pebble was the first. And I have got one of the original Pebbles, which was sent to me by Paul, uh, for which I'm very grateful. And I really like it, and it's got a week-long battery life and all the rest of it. But it seems that being first to market is not good enough because Pebble are having to shut down and effectively sell out to Fitbit. And there were rumors about this for a few days before it was actually officially announced. And it was announced on the Kickstarter page for, I think, is it the Pebble Time 2 and various other things which are not going to be delivered. People paid a lot of money and they waited and then they waited a little bit more and then they waited a little bit more. And now they are going to get a refund in March. So they're going to have to wait a quarter to get their money back. But uh, thanks to you and your lot, Paddy, they actually might make a profit if you bought one in this country because you're going to get it back in US dollars or equivalent uh, local currency. So you will have probably end up getting more pounds than you spent on it. So that's the silver lining. But this is um, bad news as as far as I'm concerned because they're going to – I don't think they're going to brick the watches, but they're certainly going to stop supporting them in terms of software updates and any sort of cloud stuff. But I'm really hoping that it won't brick my watch when they turn that stuff off. But that remains to be seen. And, and the most – egregious thing here is that if you've bought a pebble directly from them in the last few months or the last year they're not going to honor that warranty which just seems illegal to me but we'll soon see what becomes of that it's just a just a very disappointing story all around i struggle to get particularly animated about any of these sort of stories to be honest because i don't see the benefit in any of the products that are out there i I suppose as a push, I could understand why people want things like Fitbits, but anything smarter than that attached to your wrist or hung around your neck or whatever just seems to be technology for its own sake and people actually trying to invent market niches that don't and can't exist just to shift stop boxes. Well, I honestly believe that. And then I was curious about these pebbles because when they announced this Kickstarter, the the value the price i suppose of the original ones went down to the point where it was you know 25 quid or something and at that point i thought well why not give it a go and i was discussing and i'm in an r in um in the system au telegram group and that's when paul said uh, well i've got one i'm not using do you want me to send it to you and he did and i have never looked back honestly i love it i i thought it would be this useful useless and he said useful, useless novelty, but it's turned out to be a very useful bit of kit, simply for the notifications, because my phone stays in my pocket on silent, my wrist buzzes, have a quick glance at it, done. And if you're in certain social situations, it's rude to take your phone out and have a look at it, whereas a quick glance at the watch is much less noticeable. And I can see, all right, that's just a server email, don't care about that, or it's just some promotional thing. Or I can see, oh, hang on, that's my missus emailing me. I need to deal with this. I need to email her back or whatever. And yes, I could get my phone out of my pocket, but before I would, it would buzz in my pocket and then I would have to wait until I was out of that particular situation 
and and so yeah okay it's it's very first worldy it's it's very technology for its own sake but it it has improved my experience my I, i'm not going to say it's improved my life because that is you know ridiculous <laughs> but it it has improved my technological experience and i th- i think that until you've tried it you can't knock it and so now i am actively considering buying an android one possibly the sony smartwatch 3 but uh i don't know about that we'll have to see because i'm i'm concerned about updates because the whole wearables market isn't taking off because of cynical people like you by the sounds of things paddy practical people like me i think is the uh... Yeah, you don't even have a lock screen, Paddy. So you know you don't need a lock screen, screen if you don't live in London, for God's sake. Um, I know where you're going with this, I and mean, people like Motorola are sort of saying they're not going to be punting out any more of these Android Wear devices in the near future, and don't know if they're ever going to do so again. And the whole category does seem to be collapsing in on itself, doesn't it? Well, yeah, Android Wear two was due in the fall, and that did not happen. Now it's going to happen at some point next year. And so that's putting me off because I don't want to buy a watch that then is not going to get Android Wear 2 and be left behind and get no security updates and that kind of thing. So maybe once Android Wear 2 comes out and we get some new products, people will buy into it. But there's the expense problem, I think. It's it's a lot of money for something that people can't see a huge benefit in. But because I got mine for free, that's probably why I love it so much. I've heard the same thing said by people who have Apple Watches that, you know, they did admittedly buy it as a bit of a gimmick and clearly people that have Apple stuff have too much money anyway. And so they've since realised it's very useful to get the notifications and what have you. But again, aren't we in this duopoly where you either have Android Wear or Apple Watches and then there's no real sort of third contender if Pebble aren't on the market? Well, yeah, that was the good thing about Pebble, that there was this, as you say, third party. You you could buy this watch. It would work with either iOS or Android or to some extent even with Ubuntu, whereas now you basically have only got two choices unless you use Asteroid OS, which is something I had not heard of but has had an alpha release. And it's only available for a few watches, and only one of them, the LG G watch, seems to be fully functional but it, it's pretty cool that there's this third-party ROM for watches. And it's surprising, given the, the small number of watches that have been sold relative to smartphones and stuff. I mean, if the heavy lifting can be done by your phone, you know, connecting to the network and pulling the updates and your you know emails and bits and bobs, and all it has to do is just push that to the watch, it must be a lot easier to make the actual uh, interface for the watch. The difficult bit, about having this face on the watch is the sheer size of it. You know, it needs to be mostly swiping from left and right and what have you and very few tappable buttons. But it does look fairly slick, that Asteroid OS. However, as you pointed out, nothing that we can test because we haven't got any watches and the list is fairly short. Well, it's funny that Smartwatch 3, the Sony one, was on my radar of a possibility to buy. And now it's on this list, although it's not very well supported, graphics glitches and no Bluetooth, but it's tempting to buy one just to try out uh, Asteroid OS. Ah, it's Christmas. Treat yourself. Uh, I might. We'll see. Go on then. Let's wrap up the news with some more good news. Um, and we've talked about Risk V instruction set architecture on the show a few times before. And I think that's mainly because it looks to be the best hope we've got of bringing a truly open source general purpose computing platform to the masses. Well, that's my opinion anyway. Um, so a couple of things have happened recently. And first up, we've got Sci-5, which is an organization, and they've launched both a commercial SOC and a crowd supply dev board, uh, which will hopefully enable people to actually start building real systems using the hardware. And also on crowd supply, you can now find the on-chip Open5 microcontroller. And that's a completely free, as in freedom, 32-bit microcontroller. And they're aiming to start mass production on that uh, shortly and, again, supply a development board. Now, these are quite expensive for what they are in terms of power, aren't they? I mean, it's not for the hobbyist who wants to do Raspberry Pi type stuff. This is for people who will put them into IoT devices and and that kind of thing. Because it's at the moment, it's not going to compete even with ARM, really, in terms of power, never mind x86. No, this is very first gen, I think. Um, 
we've spoken about risk five as i said a few times but it's always just been in the context of people taping out stuff um and to actually see silicon being mass marketed i think it's a great step forward to be honest and we're going to see more and more of this and i think the gap will narrow i mean performance wise some of these are actually quite good i mean the sci-5 one for instance claims to be 10 times the speed of an Arduino 101. So that that should give you some decent bang for your buck there, uh, power supply issues notwithstanding. Well, here's hoping because x86 is just not happening in terms of getting a truly open hardware x86 device. ARM, not looking brilliant, looking a little bit better, but to have something that w- would be truly open, top to bottom, running proper free software, is is surely the dream. About a month or so ago, the Windows 10 anniversary update came out and uh, it worked absolutely perfectly for you, Paddy, didn't it? No problems at all. <laughs> oh no, hang on. You have to totally reinstall your entire system. But with it came the official launch, I suppose, of Bash on Ubuntu on Windows, the Lin- Linux subsystem for Windows, Windows subsystem for Linux. I can never remember which way around that is. And so you have been able to try this out properly. Now, it was announced a long time before that. I can't remember, six months ago maybe. And I tried it. I installed Windows 10 and jumped through all the hoops to get a developer account and all that and tried it out and was just a bit meh, really. I I didn't know what to do with it. But you've got a little bit more experience of Bash, so I'm hoping you got more out of it than I did. Um, So... Tell us about it. It's fairly easy to install, isn't it? It is, yeah. Um, as you mentioned, there's a couple of hoops. There are also some requirements, and the primary one really is that you're running a 64-bit version of Windows. It doesn't work on 32-bit version. As you said, it's now in the anniversary update, so it's available for Joe Public to use. But if you've got an insider account with Microsoft, so you can get latest updates for Windows, you have access to Ubuntu 1604 as well. Um, the standard version is still running 1404. And we talked about this when it was announced. You can produce proper ELF binaries with this, can't you? I mean, it is effectively proper Linux, even though it's running on Windows. It's not some dodgy emulation. It is a proper Linux without Linux being there. It's the user land that's there, and that's what's provided by Canonical. And Microsoft have done a lot of heavy lifting at the back to do all the translation uh, into the NT kernel. And there are still some gaps. Um, A lot of the network stuff is missing from the uh, 1404 version. But as I mentioned, I tried the Insider Edition uh, version as well. And things like the network stack is getting better. So whereas ping and IF config didn't actually work in the old version, if on the latest Insider Edition, they do. And it really is in that sort of area you see the work Microsoft are doing because it shares the network stack with Windows. I mean, it isn't spinning up a complete Linux network stack. Everything is getting translated through and using the network stack provided by the NT kernel. And so you end up with things like shared IP addresses. And it is seamless. And to be honest, I'm really quite impressed with it. If we just step back to you talking about installing it, is this simply on the sort of Microsoft App Store? Yeah, sorry, I'm probably getting ahead of myself. Um, no, you've got to have a valid version of Windows 10, which is either the anniversary update or one of the insider previews. Um, you then have to go in to Windows programs and features, and there's a feature there to turn on for the Windows subsystem for Linux. And also, you then have to go into a terminal, type bash, and it attempts to download it, but it won't unless you've turned on developer options as well. And they've talked about whether it's going to stay purely as a development option. Um, It obviously hides it away from people who don't know what they're doing. And the likelihood is it's going to stay as a hidden developer option. So there's a couple of places you need to turn it on. But I mean, it's very well documented on the web what you do. And once you kick kick off that bash session, it goes and grabs an image from Canonical, downloads it, installs it, um, and you're up and running, really. And then it's just in the start menu, isn't it? You just search for Ubuntu, whatever it comes up, and you just get a terminal. Yeah, and all your files are stored in a variety of subdirectories, which are also hidden away from you. Um, one of the annoying things about this is that it only operates against the NT file system. So if you are running on a multi-boot box like I am, I can't actually 
attach and interoperate with any of my other standard Linux partitions. It, it doesn't understand Linux file systems apart from the one that it comes with, and it can only actually recognize NTFS partitions. And how all that works, and in particular how file permissions work and are stored, because obviously the metadata between NTFS and the file system in Linux is quite different, and Microsoft have made very clear, and I'll stick a link in the show notes, um, that you should not attempt to do any manipulation of your Linux file systems from within Windows itself, because it will get thoroughly confused. I hear that it just totally balks it, but I haven't tried it, which kind of makes sense, doesn't it? It does, yeah, because they are different file systems, and they just don't have the functionality to store each other's metadata. So it does make sense. So the, the question is, what can you do with it? If you're a developer, you can develop in it. But apart from that, what use does it actually have? Well, let me ask a, a specific question along those lines. So the other day, I had bought something on my laptop, and I really needed to SSH into my server. And I thought, oh, this is annoying. Hang on a minute. My flatmate has a laptop that is in perfect working order because he only puts Windows on it and he doesn't mess around. He's the he's the user that wants all these things hidden away. And I thought, could I put Bash on that and then SSH into my server and do all the things I would expect to do? Would that be a suitable kind of use case? I think it's an ideal use case and it's one that I've actually used. Um, it works exactly as you'd expect. And for those of us who like Linux and use Linux every day, then I think it makes far more sense to do it that way because if you're spinning up something like Putty and having to muck around with importing keys because it doesn't actually understand public keys properly, you're far better off actually doing it from the Linux command line. And if you're forced to be using a Windows box at work or um, because you're trying to run some game or other at home, then having that standard shell there that you're used to using and access to all the software and things like SSH, it, it's a no-brainer. And were there any times that you're using it that you hit the wall to realize that you weren't in a full Linux desktop? No, not really. As I say, the only things I did notice um, on the current edition, not the insider edition, is some of the networking is a bit iffy, as I mentioned. So ifconfig and, and ping, for instance, don't work, but they do on the insider edition, and therefore that'll be getting rolled out in the fullness of time to everybody. Um it is being worked on quite actively, and there are things being changed all the time and missing functionality is getting there. 24-bit um, colour is going to be available in the shell in the new version. Uh, mouse support for the other console app that you might want to use using a mouse will be there as well. What about things like aliases? Did you try those? Uh, I didn't because I don't use aliases in real life. Yeah, I've noticed that. You just use bash scripts, don't you, instead? I do, because then it's actually obvious and in your face what you're doing. Um, I don't like anything that messes with the underlying system, to be honest. Okay, and, and all the flags and things work. It, it was all as seamless as you'd expect. I suppose that was my question about aliases, was how far, how how integrated is it and how many things can you do, which are some of the more oddities within a bash terminal? I must admit, I didn't hit anything that sort of toppled me over. Um, I can't think of any occasion where something I tried it didn't work, which means this is a very hard piece to do because I'd like to come along and say, oh, this bit's missing and this bit isn't. But say, apart from the networking side of things, which they are obviously working on, the only real difference I noticed was uh, from a file system point of view, it's, it's a little bit slower accessing things. And I guess that's because of the translation that's going on there. Uh, but running stuff, it seems fine. And it also does things it's not supposed to do in a way. I mean, they don't officially support um, X applications, but they run quite happily as far as I can tell. And you can use like Xming server or VCX serve, which is the one I chose, and quite happily sort of spin up Firefox or Thuna or whatever it is you're interested in. And the only problems you hit then are because you're basically getting a very bare bones install unless you would go back and install icon packs and what have you. Things like Thuna look a bit wacky because they're, they're missing, but I didn't find anything that didn't work, and I was really surprised by that. And if you've got Thunar running, can you interact with the Windows file system, or is it only within the Linux file system? Yeah, you can quite happily. I mean, when you spin this up, you've got access to any NTFS partitions under mount point uh, that it provides for you, and you can access those quite happily um, from X applications as you can from the uh, command line. Oh, fair enough. So 
A big question that I've got for you is you are forced to use Windows at work, but at home you exclusively use Linux. Now, is that going to change as a result of this? Or have you found it changing? Have you found yourself booting into Windows at home, not just to try this out, but to actually use it? I doubt my work style will probably change because I use Ubuntu as my primary desktop apart from at work, and I like Ubuntu. It's it's faster, and I've got things set up as I like, as Windows used to be set up. And obviously, you can install things like Classic Shell to make Windows 10 look a little bit more humane. But it's still slightly slower. Um, it's still slightly more bloated than any sort of Linux desktop, unless you're looking at the Gnomes or Ubuntus of this world. Um, and I also feel slightly happier with the security side of things on Linux. It doesn't mean that, like you, I, I wouldn't actually enter credit card details on Windows. Um, credit card details? I wouldn't even log into my email in Windows. Yeah, well, I'm happy to do that, and as is most of the world. Uh, but no, I, I can't see the use. But if I was in an environment, if I was a dev in an environment that was predominantly Windows, and this is clearly what it, this is aimed at, and you're wanting to do testing or you're wanting to run the same script to deploy services across systems and you'd normally have to be spinning up a, a vm or something to actually get to a linux system this cuts all that claptrap out and you can actually just do it and it's a far more natural way of going about things and i can see it keeping people who are already on windows within that environment and giving them less incentive to dual boot into linux or have a vm running linux but if you actually like the Linux world, I can't see it taking people away from that and putting them into Windows. Well, there's a lot more we could talk about this, but with it being Windows, I don't think we should labor it too much. But if you are interested, then check out the show notes because there's going to be some very interesting links about stuff you can do with it with other distros and, and that kind of thing. On to the feedback then and contact details. You can email us show at linuxloadouts.com. Or you can find us on Twitter, Linux Luddites. Or if you look on the website, there's links to the Facebook and Google Plus communities. Or you can always leave a comment on the website. Yep, and Mark Smith did just that and got in contact saying, you're talking on episode 92 about whether anyone still uses Honeycomb. You don't have to guess. Google publishes figures and someone on Wikipedia has kindly graphed over time. So he gives us a link there to one of these 100% uh, graphs that shows the various versions of Android uh, increasing over time and their usage and then and then dying off as new ones come out so if you go onto google and search android version history wikipedia you'll find that graph and he says it appears honeycomb itself has never had many users but gingerbread still seems to have about 1.3 percent to put that in absolute terms a year ago google claimed there were 1.4 billion active android devices so that's about 18 million on gingerbread quite a number albeit a small percentage that said, to my understanding, old things shouldn't stop working. What will happen is that new things won't work, which is what one expects. Please correct me if I'm wrong on this. Well, it depends if you get updates to those old apps that rely on the newer version of Google Play services. If you don't update your apps, like I know Paddy, you hold back updates and read all the change logs and everything first, then you'll be all right. But if you have the default behavior of auto updating your apps then some of them will just stop working but it's interesting aside looking at this graph of uh, as of june 2016 that's where it goes up to that kitkat looks to be by far the most popular version being used which is a couple of versions behind marshmallow which was at the time the current one so it goes to show there is a very serious lag there yeah, there is a long tail, isn't there? But I mean, from, from this graph, KitKat, the sort of middle time at which KitKat was being released is sort of June 2014, earliest December 2013 through to December 2014. So that's one year's worth of uh, uptake on phones and what have you. And you, I kind of think that Google should use this kind of data to decide how long they should give support for. Because obviously, as new versions come out, those old versions dwindle and die off and become the smaller percentages and they should say okay when it gets to 10 percent or 20 percent maybe they will stop giving support ah but then there'd be no incentive to update your hardware would there yeah yeah i'm just i'm battling with this idea of of end of life and what the best way of doing it is and 
just arbitrarily saying two years, it seems to be, well, <laughs> arbitrary. So it doesn't seem like the best way of doing things because people don't know that after two years, their Android device is going to stop getting updates. They're just going to carry on using it and say, oh, haven't had an update in a while. Oh, well, the three or four apps I use still work. What's the problem? Not being aware of the security problems that they're running into. And Eduardo also got in touch and picked up on our recent conversation about Chapo and asked whether we think there's any significant difference between Chapo and Carora. And I helpfully said, listen, to find out, which he didn't like very much. I suppose the, the difference is more software in Chapo and more emphasis on gaming, I suppose. Yeah, we generally felt that Chapo was a bit more bloated, a bit more sort of over the top, whereas Corora seemed like what it was advertising, as in Fedora, with the usable bits added in that are proprietary that Fedora doesn't normally include, without then going on the next step and adding loads and loads and loads more stuff. And I guess that's a decision up to you as to whether that's significant or not. Mm. So I'm moving on then. John Stoom said... At around this time last year, I bought the Linux Foundation System Administrator Certification while it was on offer. I just took my exam and wanted to give a little feedback on the course and the test. My Linux experience is mostly at home on the desktop with LMDE and Debian, and more recently with a couple of Raspberry Pis. Overall, I'd say the course does not prepare you for the test if you aren't coming from a professional IT Linux background. I took the test just to find out what was on it and scored 26 out of 100. I took the test for a second time a month after the first test and I nervously await the results. And uh, you put a little update here. He failed the second attempt, 45 out of 100, and you need 75% to pass. So that was not even particularly close. Uh, So he says, so while I don't feel the course is up to par for preparing you for the test, it gives me a bit of respect for those who have the cert. If you get it, you know what you're doing. And that's interesting because my wife started the, uh, what is it, Linux 101, the the free one, the introduction to Linux. And you get to the end of a section and it gives you these exercises. And the questions she was really struggling with because they just hadn't been covered properly. And it just, from my brief look at it, it didn't seem to be very well put together, I'm afraid, which is a bit of a disappointment. You'd think the Linux Foundation would be the sort of canonical source of knowledge on Linux, but apparently not. Yeah, and John's experience was echoed somewhat by Tom Hardy, uh, who said that he unfortunately didn't pass on the second try either. And he said, I also find it annoying and not helpful that they only give you the number grade, and don't provide any feedback on what parts you need to work on. Yeah, that is unfortunate. I suppose that's just their policy, though, but it's probably harder to give someone detailed feedback, isn't it, rather than just a score? But, I mean, reflecting John's point there about, you know, if the people who have got the certificate have clearly passed what is quite a hard test, or at least something that you can't just stroll into having had some casual use of Linux... And that's kind of, you know, the reason for having these tests is to to make sure that the people who companies are employing are getting the people who kind of know what they're doing from a more professional IT background rather than, you know, ourselves who are sort of tinkerers and and casual users. Yeah, there's definite upside there. I mean, things like the Cisco certification has had respect in the industry for quite a long time, whereas things like Microsoft Certified Professional are sort of looked down on a little bit because of ease with which that can be acquired so a difficult test is not in it of itself a bad thing but if they're not preparing you properly for it then that is not a very impressive uh, performance from the mm. Linux foundation as joe suggested yeah anyway switching topics halem sarayan got in touch and said the latest show was timely for me since i'm in the same luddite hard drive situation as paddy with my six-year-old thinkpad t410 i splashed out on a 500 gigabyte samsung ssd and had the same concerns that Paddy did about the SATA 2 interface bottleneck and transfer rate, so I was very encouraged by your positive SSD experience. And he said that he wanted to ask me about which benchmarking I was uh, talking about on the last show, and it was FIO, and I think that's how you pronounce it, it's either FIO or FIO, which is the flexible I.O. tester, and that's written by someone whose name I can't pronounce, is that Jen, Jens Axbo? 
I should say so, yeah. Um, who I should know, but I, I haven't come across, I must admit, who apparently is the current kernel maintainer for the block layer and block devices. And I did put a link in the uh, show comments last time around uh, for a quick start guide to using it, but I'll stick one in these show notes as well. And presumably that's free software, isn't it? FIO or FIO? It is indeed, yes. Ah, good. Yeah, it's, it seemed to be uh, pretty useful. It showed me the, the vast differences between various SSDs that I've got, or more specifically, the one that was on the SATA 3 interface was so much faster than the SATA 2, which is to be expected, obviously, but it really does make a big difference with the um, the smaller reads and writes. Yeah, and I think the general point is I was actually quite surprised at how much difference it made to my experience, even on this old hardware that I've got here. I mean, this, is, this is a ThinkPad X200. It is an old dual-core machine, and based on how I've got on with it, I would heartily encourage anybody who's got a, a machine of any vintage really to consider doing this sort of upgrade because it does make a huge difference and you realize how much your machine is sat there waiting for disk rather than it being processor bound. Well, I've been telling you this, Paddy, for a long time and you finally listened. Well, I know this is information that Halen will take on board because I, I did trim down his comment and he explained that he'd gone from a 7200 down to a 5400 RPM spinning disk and had noticed a change just from that, from you know um, a spinning HDD from one speed to another. So the, the move to an SSD is, uh, is one you, you have to make. So Alan Pope got in touch, uh, Popey, known by many, to say... I thought the feedback about the lack of Fedora podcast was an interesting one, as there are other distro-specific ones like Mintcast and Simply Elementary. We started Ubuntu podcast after lengthy discussions 10 years ago that it might be a fun thing to do. There have been three other Ubuntu podcasts, Mexico, USA and Canada, with shorter lifespans, and two other, French and German, ones that are still going. Maybe Ubuntu people just like evangelising. I think it simply comes down to whether there are people in the community with the commitment, skills and drive to want to do it. It's a fair amount of work to crank out weekly episodes for many years. Setting aside time on regular schedules to prepare, record, edit and publish shows is something most people aren't willing or capable of doing. All very good points. And I did actually point out to Popey that that wasn't really what I personally was getting at. I was getting at more, why is it that people from Fedora don't appear on other people's podcasts? Uh, there are several that have guests on on a regular basis and you generally don't hear from them whereas you do hear from Sousa people and, and loads from Ubuntu but um yeah all very very good points about the amount of work that goes into a podcast a eh, Paddy indeed which brings us to a sad announcement a very very sad announcement 2016 not even Linux Luddites survived and it's all your fault Paddy Jesse and I have been talking and we've decided that we can't put up with your Brexit supporting ways anymore, so you are sacked. Okay, you're going to have to clarify which parts of those are jokes and which parts of those are real, Joe. Okay, well, the fact that Paddy's sacked is the joke. Um, just because he's a Brexiter doesn't mean that we, uh, we don't still like him. So yes, Paddy doesn't have time for this anymore, and so that is pretty much going to be the end of Linux Luddites. Um, we're going to do one more show, uh, which will come out on the 26th, Boxing Day. Uh, our end of year wrap up and then that will be it unfortunately but fear not because jesse and i are making plans for a replacement show we thought that it wouldn't really be right to carry on as linux luddites without paddy and uh, we we're talking to some people who might well be involved with it we we don't have a firm plan at this stage we're hoping that by the next show we will have a firm plan and we'll be able to announce something properly but all we know for now for sure is that um 94 will be the last one and um so in terms of flatter and, and paypal donations and stuff like that um feel free to cancel it yourself or if you haven't done that by the end of december we will pull the plug on all of that we'll cancel all of the um the monthly supporters but uh we will leave the paypal open until um about mid-march so if you do want to buy us a beer as a send-off then um the uh all the details will be on the website donate at linuxloadouts.com is the paypal email address and the merch shop as well you can buy all the t-shirts and mugs and everything that we will shut down at the end of january so you'll have about a month after we finish the show to 
buy any souvenirs if you want them. And yeah, it's been a good three years that we've been doing this. And Paddy, you will be sorely missed. But um, circumstances change and you just don't have time to do it anymore, do you? I don't, I'm afraid, no. It, it seems shocking thinking it is three years. Yeah, a lot's happened in that time. And we started out as just me and you, Paddy. And Jesse came on board episode 20, was it? Yeah, it's about 20, yeah. And uh, it's it seems like we couldn't do it without any of us, if you know what I mean. And um, that's why I think that it's not right to to just carry on and replace you, Paddy. So the old order changeth, yielding place to new, as they say. So uh, stay tuned in the next episode when hopefully we'll have more details about that. Throughout the life of the show, we have followed the development of Ubuntu Touch quite closely with great interest and sometimes not being particularly positive about it. We looked at it back on show 35 fairly early on, and then we looked at it last um, on show 72, which was February of this year. And so we thought, well, let's check in with it. OTA 14 has just dropped. Let's see what's improved, what hasn't improved. Where are we with it? And thanks to Magic Device Tool, it's incredibly easy to flash on a Nexus 7, which all three of us have done. And so we've all hopefully had a similar-ish experience. If I can just start and say how a fantastic Magic Device Tool is. You've mentioned it on a previous show. I hadn't had cause to use it uh, until now. And it just makes life absolutely simple, as you say. And it's by far and away the most positive I can take out of this review. Assuming you're running Ubuntu, it's really easy, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Arch, not so much there then. Yeah, I had to uh, boot my laptop into the other distribution I have on there and uh, and run it from there. I did think about actually going through the uh, the shell scripts because it's really easy once you've got the scripts and you can look through them. Uh, so, for example, I did a sed command that removed all of the sleeps so that it just, just went through really quickly. Um, but it was annoying that it while it should use the same commands on Arch as Ubuntu, it clearly didn't. So I'm tempted to go through and give him some uh, comments and some commits on Git because it's shell scripts are something that I can read and, and mess around with. However, absolutely right. Once you've got it working on the uh, Magic Device tool, it's, it's very simple to use. So I'm not quite sure when you guys first installed this. I did a couple of weeks back, so I ended up on OTA 13 and had a play with that before getting the uh, pushed update for 14. No, I didn't because I flashed RC proposed because I wanted to try the newer version of it. And I kind of had mentally planned to check out 13, but then 14 came out and I didn't get around to it. So, I mean, briefly, what, what was the state of 13 then? I think as much as the state of 14, to be honest. I mean, the only difference I really noticed was in the app switchery application thing. Um, but we're getting ahead of ourselves a bit there, I think. Shall we go back to the start and talk about the actual setup process? Well, I found that it is less involved than it used to be. It used to force you through the tutorial yeah. straight away, whereas now you get sort of random bits of the tutorial popping up, well, randomly. <laughs> yeah, when you say randomly, I feel like it wasn't random enough that I felt that it was doing it at a predefined time based on what I was doing, it just seemed to go, oh, and also there's this I can do. And oh, you might want to know this. It, it was odd that it didn't have either one full sort of introduction at the start or somehow context-aware information coming up as I was doing stuff. Yeah, and it also didn't prompt for everything that you could possibly do. I mean, a lot of the multi-touch gesture support was never actually explained within that. And there's an awful lot of that if you look at the Ubuntu website, which I ended up having to do to work out how to do things with two and three fingers. Oh, no, I've just tried now and I've accidentally opened the Amazon app. Ah, how do I get rid of it? <laughs> what what can you do with two and three fingers? I didn't look at the website. Well, there's things like moving an app to the side onto the, what they call the side stage so you can have two apps open at once. Ooh, didn't know about that. Oh, so you can. So that makes what is normally a full screen tablet app into the sort of much smaller version that would be on a phone. So obviously there's a difference between the amount of real estate you have on a tablet, which is what we reviewed it on, versus what you'd have to have if you had one of the MyZoo phones or what have you. And it does sort of squish what is 
the rest of the screen down to two thirds. So if you've got maybe another app open behind it or one of the scopes open, it will squish that down to two thirds on the left hand side and have your sort of phone sized app on the right hand side. Because I'd seen that previously without knowing about this three finger swipe, which is actually pretty slick. When I opened the the clock app, because that only opens as a phone app on the right hand side. Right, which brings me to the elephant in the room here that only works in landscape mode and does not work in portrait. And and that's something I wanted to address of whether this is supposed to be used in landscape or portrait. It sort of, the lock screen is always landscape, even if you're holding it in portrait. It, it sort of doesn't seem to know where it is. It, it seems that originally when we looked at it, it was basically all landscape, wasn't it? Whereas now they have addressed some of the issues that people have had Jezra being one of the, the particularly vocal people about that, wanting to use it in portrait mode. But it, it just sort of, it's not quite there yet, is it? No, it's still very rough around the edges. I mean, like you, I'd set this to be locked in portrait mode and was a bit surprised when it woke up in landscape. And then as soon as you press the login button, um, it switches back to portrait for you. And it just won't actually lock into portrait mode. And it also doesn't recognize a Nexus case, uh, which is something I, I grumbled about last time. It's only a magnet sensor um, that works crappily under Android and everything else. You'd have thought that would be fixed by now. And also, while I'm just grumbling about lock screen options, the only options that are there are a four-digit PIN or a passcode or none. And obviously, I have none because I don't live in London. Um, but if you're interested, you would, I would have thought there'd be a pattern option there at least, which you get in Android. I wonder if that could be a patent patent problem that they, they don't want to get in trouble for ripping that off from Android. Yeah, I think there's a few places where I had that th exact same thought when I was playing with this. I mean, another one was in manipulating images where sort of pinch to zoom works, but I was expecting people to twiddle my fingers around to actually turn an image or rotate an image, and that didn't work. Now, I can't imagine they didn't think of doing that well, actually, I can imagine they didn't think of doing that. But let's, let's assume they <laughs> did think of it, and it is a patent issue. And it'd be good to know some of the areas they can't develop stuff in from a purely patent perspective, because otherwise we're just left assuming they haven't thought of stuff or haven't been bothered to do stuff. So we've talked there about portrait to landscape, and it's one of my plus points, actually, is that previously it was just non-existent. They couldn't deal with the idea of rotating it. Whereas as soon as you install this one, you get past the always landscape lock screen. The switch from portrait to landscape, I thought was very slick. So I didn't lock it, obviously, but it was a, it was much improved and you can turn it all the way around. Whereas you'll find on an Android device that you want to allow portrait and landscape, it'll only have one way up that it allows you to go landscape. Or you can't turn a phone upside down and have it portrait still, unless you have some particular sound engine mod uh, updates from what have you. So I was, I was pleased to see that they allowed you to just basically turn the phone all the way around. And it's quite quick to recognize. You know that thing where people turn their phone and then shake it as if that's going to improve the speed at which it recognizes what it's doing? No, that does improve the speed. Yeah, of course it does, yeah. Um, but with with the uh, with Ubuntu Touch, I found that it was pretty sharp to recognize. So that was quite nice. How dare you imply that I'm wrong about that? But yeah, there are definitely some sort of Sorry, I'm going to gloss over your wrongness, Joe. There are definitely <laughs> some, some, like you say, rough edges. So uh, when you first load it up, obviously it likes to connect to the Wi-Fi so that it can do updates and, and get you logged in and what have you. And when I was trying to connect to my 5 gigahertz network, it wouldn't connect, even though it sort of had like a little tick saying it was connected. And I kept on typing in the password and it just wouldn't, wouldn't have it. I then switched to my 2.4 gigahertz network and it was fine. So... Maybe there's a bit of funniness about that, or there was also some discrepancy between when you're typing and it trying to put the information into the the password box. So this is sort of a general overall feel that I got that it's not. I don't want to say it's not snappy because in certain times it is, like when I was talking about the portrait landscape. But sometimes when you're trying to input information, you just feel like it's lagging behind a bit, and you're not quite sure if it's recognised the the button that you've pressed. Do you guys have that as well? Absolutely. I have a note here um, saying that be very careful during the initial setup process as well as later on when you're running specific apps because if you're not careful, you'll just be hitting the skip button or the next button, whatever it was called, 
um, too fast and you'll actually miss steps out from the setup process. And that's what happened to me the first time around. I thought, oh, there's loads of stuff missing in this. It just asks you for language and bosh, you're more or less done. Um, and no, it's because I was getting frustrated and hit the next button a couple of times and it, it skips straight past the Wi-Fi and the location thing. Yes, there's there's Wi-Fi setup, you know, for for a fresh install, let's go through that. There's a Wi-Fi setup, ask for your town rather than your time zone. It seems very specific about that. Uh, a preferred name, your lock screen preferences you've touched on there, Paddy, password, passcode or none. And your password has to be at least eight characters. And then it has sort of a, a welcome to Ubuntu, you're now ready, and off you go. So it does have a fairly standard kind of get the information in, get yourself logged in, what have you. And then your straight into the the home scope, I think it's called. You are, and I was a bit surprised, actually, you weren't prompted to either create or sign into your Ubuntu One account at that stage during the initial setup. Absolutely. It's only when you go into the App Store and you try and install something that it then says, oh, no, 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 you need to now have your Ubuntu One account and off you go. So I was also surprised that it didn't just have it right at the start and it's only when you want to you know, use the device more than the default apps that you have to have to log in. Now, I remember this was one of Joe's major complaints from last time around that you did have to sign in to get applications and such like. But I noticed because I, I tried signing out of my account and uh, just seeing whether I got any updates anyway. And the system update to OTA 14 appeared to come through without me being signed in. So it looks as though the basic system will now update. It's just the applications won't without a valid Ubuntu account. I thought that was always the case, wasn't it? That the, the base system would update without an account, but you couldn't update applications or install new ones. Am, am I wrong about that? Well, maybe my memory of this isn't right. I thought it was that across the board, you couldn't get any updates whatsoever without an account. Well, I mean, can we talk about updates and how that is one of the big positives here, that they have been working with these devices and this one in particular for an awfully long time, and they are still supporting it. If you flashed Ubuntu onto your Nexus 7 and used it full time a couple of years ago, you're still getting security updates. They, they do seem committed to that, don't they? You do get regular updates and security patches, which is something that cannot be said for a lot of Android manufacturers. Now, perhaps that's because they've got far fewer devices to support, but that, that to me feels like a potential reason to make the switch. And, you know, without getting to the conclusion, it's not there yet. But once it does get there, I'm going to feel far more confident in getting security updates and indeed feature updates for a longer time with Ubuntu than I am going to with Android. Yeah, I was thinking about the fact that they don't have as many devices. So that is obviously allows them to spend the time to make sure that everything is updated and, and keeps getting security updates. And also the fact that they are having to do this on a device that they know a lot of people have and can tinker with. Do you know, if, if they were going to bring out on like an S3, you don't know that everyone has an S3. You don't know that everyone has uh, a Motorola, whatever it is. But the Nexus 7, I think, sold very well and sold very well to the market that they're sort of aiming at, you know, the nerds who are on the Nexus devices and, and things like this. So it's quite a good example of a slightly not disposable but tweakable device that you can play with like we are and then go back to android if you so wish or you know keep it on there and keep getting the updates i wonder if they were a massively popular um mobile operating system whether they would have kept on keeping this up to date i suppose only time will tell as to how well they keep their phones up to date i suppose it's a huge bonus from as well that uh, google have dropped nexuses now because those of us with Nexi, if I get the plural correct, um, they're the only versions they're going to put out because the pixels are obviously frighteningly expensive. That most most people aren't going to rush out and buy one of those. And what they're doing with tablets full stop is a, is another question. Yeah, I suppose if you're not going to get another seven inch Nexus tablet, no one's going to buy one. Obviously, it doesn't exist, and so there's going to be a lot of these kicking around that people will still be interested to use. And I mean, there's no reason why I should stop using this, whether it's with Sanjad Mud or Ubuntu. Normally, I think we sort of try and uh, make sure that we go through the install and, and what apps there are and how to install apps, things like this. But I think we're going to have to just break it down to two segments of these are the things that are good and they're doing well, and these are the areas for improvement. 
So I'll start with a, a good one that I thought was uh, very useful. And that is that within the security options, the security settings, you can go in and turn on and off individual app permissions. So let's say, for example, you start the camera and it says, you know, before you take a photo, it says, will you allow the camera app to use the camera? Yes, fine. When you switch to video, it says, when just before you start recording a video, it says, do you allow the, the camera app to use your microphone? Yes, fine. But then if you decide to change that, you can go into the settings in security and you can then find, okay, which applications are using my microphone? I don't want those ones to use it. And you can turn them on and off with little flick, uh, little switches. So I think that's a really useful thing. It's very clear. It's very obvious. And you can go in and make those changes at any point for any app. So that's that's a really good uh, way of dealing with that problem. Yeah, I was impressed with the granular access control there as well. And if it's not obvious from what we've been saying, none of the pre-installed apps come with any privileges out of the box. You have to explicitly allow them to do anything at all. Um, so they're clearly taking user control and security and privacy issues quite seriously, which is good to see. And another positive is the indicators, the, the indicator control at the uh, top right where you can drag down. I mean, we, we talked about this, I think, the first time we looked at Ubuntu Touch, the fact that you can drag down on a specific icon, for example, the the network one, and then you can swipe left and right to, to change the, the various ones. I mean, it, it just feels slicker than Android. It is slicker than Android. The fact that you can hunt for the right, let's say, the Bluetooth icon at the top there, pull down, and you're actually in the Bluetooth settings. It's, it's a lot slicker than Android. Slight fly in the ointment that I found was that notifications don't auto clear. So, for instance, if you're getting um, email and you actually read it in Deco, the notification saying you've got new email doesn't disappear from that area, which I would have expected it to do so. Okay, so as penalty for bringing up a negative during our positive segment. <laughs> Sorry. Have you got a positive, Paddy? Yeah, I think the system setting area, just talking about that sort of side of things, um, is far improved on what it used to be. It's all nice and clearly laid out, logically laid out, and again, is better than Android. And, of course, let's not forget the fact that this is a proper Linux box, very, very nearly, or you can treat it that way. You've got a proper terminal. You can remount the file system, read-write, and, and have a proper Linux box and a tablet at the same time. And we've talked about that previously, so let's not labor it too much, but it, that is a massive advantage to the kind of person that is listening to this show rather than just android which yes it has a linux kernel yes you can get a terminal going yes you can get debian in a cheroot but at the same time it's not proper linux is it whereas this feels a lot closer it does um i actually had that down as one of my negatives so can we come back to us at the end <laughs> okay but just to pick up on what you were talking about the terminal app i think that's really sweet now and it's got a lot of sensible defaults and also a way to change things like color scheme and font size. And it's a really well worked app now. Yeah, and it has a number of sort of preset uh, sort of fast access. So if you want control C, control V, those sorts of things, and then maybe you want to switch to the function keys from your keyboard or you want to switch to alt keys or something, there's sort of a, a very quick switcher that allows you to have these, these preset control and something else. Uh, allowing you to to use those functions very quickly. Annoyingly, so I use uh, a terminal app on my Android phone, and there is a control button that you can press, which stays lit while you search for the other key you want to press. So, Control C, Control V, or whatever it may be. But on Ubuntu Touch, I didn't find a control key that I could press and then pick what I wanted. So, for example, I will often do Control L to clear the terminal to allow me a nice fresh space and give me that feeling of purity. But it wasn't on there, so there was no Control L going on. But it does have Control R and Control C, which are my most common shortcuts in the terminal, I must say. I take it you were talking about Juice SSH there on Android. Yes. Yeah, which is very good. Yeah, I must say, using this terminal, although I did like the Control R and Control C, it, it wasn't quite as good as Juice SSH. Although that is proprietary, so I don't think it's fair to compare it. Or is it? I suppose you would argue that it is, Paddy. Yes, of course it is. Fair enough. 
Uh, I've also got that plugging in and unplugging headphones brings up the the audio sort of uh, notification and tells you that it's on headphone or on speaker. And then you can also, you know, use the slider that pops up with it to select whether you want it sort of quieter when you have headphones on or, or whatever. So that's a nice little tweak that I've never seen on any other mobile operating system or even on on Linux at all. So that's that's a nice nice thought. Uh, how are you guys with your list of positives? <laughs> Finished, I think. <laughs> I thought the keyboard seemed better than it used to be, to be honest. I th- I, certainly from the first time we used it, but I'm not sure if it's vastly improved from the second time. Okay, so maybe we should move to the slightly longer segment of areas for improvement. <laughs> You're such a diplomat. Yes, I work for a big corporation. <laughs> the first one for me is the fact that if it's sitting on your desk, it just randomly lights up and therefore drains your battery. And therefore, I have to turn it off when I'm not using it, which is something that I don't have to do with Android. Android is very good if you turn Wi Fi off and sit it on your desk, it can sit there for a month and not go flat. Whereas this, after a day or so, it's just dead. So I'd argue that Android has only brought that in with Doze. And yes, Doze is very useful for keeping your battery alive over overnight when it's not doing anything. But I also had that. I thought at first it was maybe recognising movement as I, you know, if it was sat on the bed and I sat on the bed, it, it recognised the movement. Or maybe I'd wave my hand over it because I'm used to my Motorola or whatever. But I then realised that none of these things are in a Nexus 7. And so it must be just this random lighting up and lo and behold as we were doing uh, the rest of the show earlier i've had it on my desk waiting to do this segment and within that two or three times it just lights up randomly you think well what's happened there what's going on so if that's your one joe uh, i'll uh, take one as a problem with pocket cast now the native app for listen to podcasts is called podbird and that allows you to play a podcast and you can switch applications and it carries on playing however I couldn't see how you could actually download a podcast. It just seemed to stream it every time. And unless it was in a very odd triple swipe that I didn't know of, I could see no way of of downloading my podcasts, which is obviously problematic. And I am a Pocket Cast fan on my my Android device. And I've heard other podcasts in which Martin Wimpress has talked about um, getting a Pocket Cast sort of web app into it so that he can use Pocket Cast and that's his choice as well. And I, so I installed that, but that has the fundamental problem that unless it's taking up the the screen, unless it is the app you are using, when you swipe to another app, it no longer gets control of the audio. So you can't actually listen to podcasts and do other things at the same time, which is obviously f- fundamentally quite a big problem. Yeah, and you mentioned Podbird there, which obviously is the go-to one, the one recommended in the app store. So that's the one I tried. And I was a bit stunned to see you can't actually do imports. So if you've got a list of podcasts, and I listen to a lot of shows, um, you have to manually add them one at a time. And so I had to dig around because I noticed this feature was missing last time we looked at this. And as far as I can see, at least the March before last, this was requested by somebody. So it's been sat there since then, a pretty basic functionality missing. And I had a similar sort of experience with the RSS reader, to be honest, which is called Shorts. And that doesn't have a import all option. So if you've got a lot of feeds, as I have, I mean, I was very thankful I haven't organized into folders because you can tick each folder and say import the contents of that folder. But if you just had a flat hierarchy with two or 300 feeds in, you'd have to manually tick each one to get the import going. So I guess these are just sort of basic things that would add huge value to the applications that you see there. And I honestly don't understand why they're not there because they are so fundamental to how most people would use these applications. You'd think they'd be no-brainers, to be honest. Well, I mean, is that not a problem based on the fact that a lot of these applications are being developed in people's spare time and they simply don't have time to do it, a full job of it, as it were? I don't think that's fair because Canonical, obviously, are investing a lot of time, money, and reputation in this as a product. and if they're not prepared to spend a little bit of money to pay people to implement basic features, then they're doing something wrong. If they're expecting the community to come up with the ideal application, then they're doing something wrong. That They should be 
setting out guidelines and saying this is some basic functionality we want. If it means paying someone to do it, pay someone to do it. Otherwise, you're going to end up with all sorts of vague annoyances and inconsistencies. And I think we've probably all experienced inconsistencies around this. I mean, one of the things I noticed was the, the calculator application. Now, a calculator is a simple thing. But the first time you start it, you're greeted by 11 screens, 11 screens of hints to scroll through before you actually get to the calculator. And a calculator is a simple application to use. And more complex applications, like the calendar, you straight in. No explanation screens whatsoever. So there's a mass of inconsistencies going on here. It sounds like it's teaching you fundamental maths before you even get to the calculator. I'm surprised you mentioned the calendar didn't have any uh, sort of intro screens because I generally found that when you loaded one of the default applications, and obviously I didn't load the calendar, but all the other ones seem to have this sort of uh, four or five screens that say, try this, do this, use that, this is how it works, which is quite typical, but I find generally quite useful because also you can skip the whole thing if you know what you're doing or work your way through them. So I'm surprised, as you say, that the the calculator is so detailed in, in how you use what is something that I think everyone knows how to use. I think we need to take back one of your positives, Jesse. You know, you said that no matter which way you turn the tablet, it um, it will always be upright. Well, that means that you can't write rude words in the calculator and turn it upside down to view them. Yeah, that's a good point. It's, uh, it's like it's got sort of a, a parental lock on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How about connectivity with third-party services? I mean, I obviously logged into my Gmail account um, trying to sync up my Gmail with Deco and also get my calendar working and all the rest of it. And for me, it didn't work the first time as it didn't last time we tried looking at this. It it takes a a few times, even if you do it in a central place, and now there is a central place to actually add an account that theoretically applies across the whole system – you go into the applications thereafter and they say, oh, you've got a Google account to attach to this. Do you want me to do it? And you say, yes, please. And it doesn't. And then you go in again and it asks you again and it doesn't. And then you go in the third time or fourth time and it eventually does. I mean, what was your experience on that side of things? Well, the third party app that I was trying to get to work was LastPass because once I've got LastPass on, I can then access Facebook and eBay and all these other bits and bobs that I'd sort of uh, installed or wanted to look at the scopes for, for example. Um, But I say, LastPass is the go-to one. And I have um, two-factor authentication on that. So I have my YubiKey, and normally on an Android phone, it's got NFC. So you type in your LastPass password, it says, right, show me the YubiKey, and you hold up to the back. But either it doesn't work, but I think more likely is that the Nexus 7 doesn't have NFC. And so I was sort of rubbing this key all over the back, trying to find where it was, and it wasn't helping. And then I thought, well, actually, perhaps it would recognize it as a USB device, and therefore it would would know what was going on. Because obviously, a Nexus 7 has a micro USB port. All I need is an OTG cable, and I can plug it in as a USB dongle. But I didn't have an OTG cable and that's not the kind of thing that you normally carry around with you. So I never got LastPass installed. Well, I got it installed, but I never got it uh, logged on. And so I didn't go to then use Facebook and Gmail and things like this. Well, at least you got it installed. I mean, I use KeyPassX as my password manager on Linux and also on Windows and KeyPass on Android. And KeyPass isn't available for this. And it's an awful lot of things weren't available for this. And the things that were, there were many duplicates of. And trying to work out what was the official one, what was the best one to try, short of going through all the different options, was something else I found incredibly frustrating. Duplicates. Absolutely right. Finger on it there, Paddy. So Plex, something that I use all the time. And so I thought, all right, let's have a look for the Plex app. There are three Plex apps. And none of them are official because Plex doesn't make an official app for Ubuntu. So I know they're all interpretations of the web user interface or some app that someone's made, you know. And without going through each one and choosing the one I wanted or maybe looking at the recommendations or, you know, the star rating, what have you, it seems annoying that there's that number of apps for one thing, like you're saying, but zero apps for something else, which you think should be on there. I've heard Wimpress talking about this, and he just goes by whatever's the highest rated one, which um, doesn't seem ideal, really. It would be much better if there was an official app. And I mean, that that is the main problem here, isn't it? That 
there just aren't many apps available for this. And this has been the problem since day one. And they're not going to solve that problem just by sitting around and waiting for it to be solved, are they? They're going to have to, as you say, Paddy, spend some money and and get the the major people like pay Microsoft to port Skype over to it uh, and pay Facebook to port WhatsApp, that sort of thing. Otherwise, it's just not going to happen for them. But one positive, uh, I know we're in the uh, improvement, room for improvement or whatever section. Maybe but- we're in the, let's just get get to the end of the notes. <laughs> All right, well, one positive thing is the, the convergence stuff, which uh, we talked about a lot last time. If you plug in a keyboard or mouse, you get windowing, which seems to work reasonably well. Um, my cable to plug it into a monitor is broken, and so I didn't get a chance to look at that. Did you get a chance to look at that, Jesse? I didn't, but I'm glad you brought this up because it was, again, one of the positives I realized I'd missed. Um, if you look in the in one of the pull-down notifications, you've got a system which is sort of about this device, Ubuntu help, things like this, and there's a simple switch that allows you to switch to desktop mode, and all of the open applications you have just window themselves, and then you've got sort of a, a, a windowed desktop. So I was really impressed by that. I didn't get to the point of using it on a main uh monitor but i can imagine that it's fairly seamless with the with the mouse and what have you because you know just using your finger on the tablet it, it seems to know what it's doing that just reminded me of another negative thank you jesse um <laughs> the ubuntu help thing that you just referenced that's available online only so if you're having wi-fi issues and you click on help you aren't going to get any help <laughs> i mean this should be local to the device yeah i mean the kind of file size we're talking for you know a few html files is minimal isn't it there's no reason why that couldn't be local well i suppose let's try and um, draw this to a conclusion then and the way i see it it is good that we've got an alternative to android i would very much like it to be more progressed you know progressed to a better point and it is clearly lagging behind it i mean there's no point pretending otherwise is there and i think that one of the reasons for that is because it's been developed in the open. And so we, we're dipping our toes in and there are people who are constantly looking at it and seeing it develop slowly over time. But you can't help but feel that if Canonical is really serious about this, they need to step up. They need to spend more money. They need to hire some of the best engineers they can to make it better and, and importantly, get those applications working on it because as good as scopes are, I just I don't think it's a replacement for native apps because people are used to having WhatsApp. I mean, I suppose it doesn't matter which way you do it. It could be a scope, it could be an app, it doesn't matter. Can I chat to my friends on WhatsApp on this Ubuntu phone or tablet or whatever? Well, I suppose tablet's unfair because you can't use WhatsApp on a tablet. But say you've got a phone, can I talk to my friends on WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger? If they can't do stuff like that, people are not going to use this platform. And it is, unfortunately, as simple as that. Yeah, and I'm not sure people will take it on board either because engineers don't use WhatsApp. The world uses WhatsApp. Uh, People involved in our community tend to sort of use Telegram or some other faux open system. So they won't even think about sort of chasing down the WhatsApp market. I don't know. I, I alluded earlier to the fact that it felt to me very much like Linux does on the desktop. It's sort of a collection of bits and bobs, and some of them are good and some not so much. Sort of lacking some basic integration. And although Android can be a little bit clunky in parts, mostly it just works, and it's a product. Whereas this, to me, felt like a grab bag of pieces from different jigsaws. And it's like a half-finished platform, not a product. Yeah, I'm not sure I can add more to that. When I first started using it for this review, I was pleased to see that it seemed a little bit bit more slick than when we'd last used it. But actually, when you sort of get down into it, you realise that there's just too many areas that it isn't quite up to scratch. If you overlook the fact it doesn't have a whole stack of apps that you're expecting or would like to use, you know, on a tablet, you may just need to access the internet and, and have a little web browser and what have you. But actually, there's enough things that great for me not even to really want it for that and i i can't help but think there are people who bought phones with this on you know a year ago 
how would they how are they using those and how are they getting on with it they must be tearing their hair out by now if we're looking at it you know the most recent version the OTA 14 and it still has these various sort of problems and what have you well very harsh words from all of us but we're not going to sit here and pretend that it's something that it isn't but uh, with that then we're coming to the end of another Linux Luddites you can email us at show at linuxluddites.com or find us on Twitter at Linux Luddites or at the Google Plus and Facebook communities or leave a comment on the website thanks for joining me Paddy and Jesse and thanks to everyone for listening we'll see you again in two weeks with more Linux news reviews comment and generally being grumpy goodbye everybody goodbye all See you later.